Hey, welcome back to the Cash PT Lunch Hour podcast. This is Aaron LeBauer, your host, and today my special guest is Nick Rolnick. Um, Nick is a physical therapist and performance uh, specialist, and his specialty is BFR, so blood flow restriction. Nick is the uh, uh, co-founder of the BFR Pros. I always want to say BFR Bros because it looks like if on social media, I would be hanging out with my bros if I was hanging out with them. So Nick, welcome to the show. I appreciate you being here. Thanks so much. Really appreciate you having me and uh, looking forward to a little bit of discussion wherever this may lead. Yeah, awesome, man. Well, tell me, um, ha- like, what is BFR? And what, like, just for, I mean, because I know there's people out there that have heard about it, but I haven't really heard about it other than what I see on social media over the last year. So you give us a little brief, like, synopsis of what it is and, like, ha- like who benefits from it or how you're helping people with it. Yeah, I mean, I think I think first before we even talk about BFR, it's probably pertinent to understand or at least gain an appreciation for how uh, blood flow restriction fits into my own personal philosophy, and mm-hmm. and how that then shapes where I've been heading in BFR. And for for me, as uh, my physical therapy practice, I'm a cash cash based out of network. Uh, physical therapy practice that's just me so it's the human performance mechanic and um, my mission as the human performance mechanic is to really make this world a healthier and happier place to be by getting people back to the activities that they love as quickly as possible and by using the most evidence-based modalities Mm -hmm. that are for me uh, things like blood flow restriction and blood flow restriction involves the use of a cuff that's calibrated by some sort of technology, whether that's automatically via a computer um, or manually via a Doppler, an external Doppler and a sphygmometer. And what that is, is we're, we're then exercising, typically exercising, you can apply without exercise, but we're exercising at very low weights. So anywhere from 20 to 40, even 50% uh, has shown efficacy of the one rep max. And in doing so, we can then accelerate the fatigue process uh, using very light loads. So this actually was was discovered, I guess, if you want to call it that, um, by uh, this guy named Yoshiaki Sato back in 1966. And he was actually a, a teenager at the time. And he was interested in building muscle and I think he was at a Buddhist, uh, Buddhist uh, church and he was on his uh, knees and he started to feel a little bit of like burning in the calves. And I always make this joke in my courses. I teach is like, Oh, well, you know, for us physical therapists, we're always thinking sciatica. And Mm -hmm. instead of uh, the teenager bodybuilder, I uh, was like, oh, well, you know, let me just try to wrap something around my leg and see if it, 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 it can replicate that feeling. And that was the birth of, of katsu or added pressure training in Japan. And since then, it it's really been making a lot of headway, most recently in the last three or four years. But in general, if you look, um, a lot of different people in Japan are have been using it from cardiovascular disease uh, to performance and now it's kind of trickled and made its way into uh, the Western uh, part of the world and uh, is known as blood flow restriction training. And so we can now use lighter loads to challenge our musculoskeletal system to, to gain similar benefits in muscle mass and, and strength as heavier lifting, which opens up a lot of opportunity for us in the rehab realm. And so getting back to my own personal philosophy is, is that when we're injured, we're really not able to challenge ourselves to, to the degree of, uh, of adaptation, of fostering adaptation. That's why we see a lot of atrophy that, that occurs. Um, and really atrophy is just a symptom of all the negative things that are, under, that are changing inside of our body uh, when we're not using our muscle. And so that's just the symptom. Um, and so with blood flow restriction, because we're able to use such very light weights, we're now able to create similar adaptations as if they were lifting heavy. And so we can accelerate their, their rehab 
and, uh, and, and performance with the use of blood flow restriction. And that really makes people happy and, mm-hmm. and, and getting them back to the activities that they love quicker than the traditional means is, is really what exemplifies BFR. And so for BFR, believe it or not, um, the BFR pros is actually not, doesn't stand for blood flow restriction pros. It actually stands for the better for results pros. And it's any technology that is out there that is proving to be better than traditional uh, our traditional, uh, you know, peanut butter and jelly type approaches in rehab. So that's kind of how everything fit together or blood flow restriction fits into my own personal philosophy is that mm-hmm. the research now is, is, is really supporting that this is a viable approach to not only rehab, but performance. And it is safe and when used appropriately. And uh, yeah, so it's, it's really nice to see that, that now blood flow restriction is, is gaining popularity. And so my, my job or what my, my self-imposed job is, is to try to make sure that safe practice is adopted mm-hmm. uh, as we continue to, as this continues to grow. So, awesome. so that's kind of, uh, what that's was your first, like, wh- when did you first learn about it? Was it in school or, you know, after practicing for a little while, you know? So I've always been, I've always been interested in health and fitness and prior to uh, getting my doctorate at Columbia, um, I actually had a master's degree uh, from American in health promotion um, mm-hmm. because I graduated college, had no idea what I wanted to do, uh, liked to party uh, like a lot of people, but never really had the grades and never really found my passion. And I'm definitely one of those people that if it's hard to keep my attention until you have it and then you really have it. Um, and so I was uh, in my master's degree program, you know, I, I've, I've been into strength and conditioning. And so I've come across blood flow restriction literature prior to PT school and, and saying, oh, that, that kind of makes a little bit of sense. And so I kind of filed that in my back, my back pocket. And really, it wasn't until I started to see the segments uh, when I was in PT school uh, with Dwight Howard and, and blood flow restriction that really was like, oh, wait, let me, let me circle back to this. And, and that's when now in PT school, uh, I was like, okay, well, let's see how this fits into rehab, going back to the science. And it, it became a, a very obsessive type of uh, of practice because i really got way into it and and understanding that this 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 actually makes a lot of sense uh and Mm -hmm. and it's something that can really improve what we're doing as as rehab providers and that's kind of how it all started and then i I got into owens which owens recovery science has been one of the leaders johnny owens has definitely been a western pioneer in in bringing this at least to the clinical side and uh yeah so i'm following dr lenicky's work who's another pioneer in in the in the field and so just pretty much absorbing, doing as much, being a sponge and trying to just, again, get, get safe practice out there with, through, you know, my social media accounts and everything. Right. So did you have like a personal experience where you're like, all of a sudden, like, did you try it for yourself and like, oh, oh man, yeah. like, 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 I'm like Jack. Now. I don't know. Like, yeah, what, what's no, the, what, mean, were you like, like holy cow, you... I can like bench more now and I didn't do anything like. So, (laughs) yeah, I mean, so you have to also take a step back and you have to realize that, uh, so I was a competitive bodybuilder. um, And so bodybuilders will do whatever Mm -hmm. possible to, to make gains. Mm -hmm. I mean, and so BFR or, or at least the primitive form of BFR, practical BFR, where you wrap a knee wrap around your arms, your legs at a perceived tightness of, of seven out of 10 to theoretically allow for blood flow in, but occlude blood flow out um, has been shown to be effective. And that was kind of the, my first foray into blood flow restriction. And really the pump that you get, mm-hmm. especially with using like light loads is, is insane. Skin stretching, like unbelievable. And that, that to me was like, oh wow, okay, I can I can replicate this feeling with with heavy loads, but using light loads, and I was always injured because uh, I was overtraining. I really didn't know, uh, you know, hindsight twenty twenty, but right. you, you never really know what what you're doing when you go through it, even though you think you know. Um, and so I was always training injured, and so high volume training with light loads was something that always was uh, was was a, a 
tool in my toolbox and blood flow restriction was, was used in, in that regard. And mm-hmm. that was kind of like the, the practical aspect of it from a bodybuilding perspective. Cause you can't go hundred percent eight days a week. No, no, you can't do that. And but BFR could, could allow you to, to replicate that intensity and not stress your joints to the, to the same degree. So that's where it really uh, took a hold of, of me. And, you know, it's been, it's been, it was periodically used throughout my training. Um, but really it was, it was in rehab mm-hmm. when I was studying to be a physical therapist that it really kind of uh, took flight. For me, yeah. Um, yeah. was it working with a patient or like rehab? No, this was or? literally this was literally like uh, like on the rare chances in PT school that I was able to watch television, mm-hmm. um, and I and 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 peruse ESPN.com that I was I was you know I saw Dwight Howard undergoing that rehab and um, Stefania Bell talking about BFR and remembering I was like oh wait a second that's the same type of stuff that I'm doing, but then they're using it for injured popular. And I was like, Oh, I connected the dots at that point. And I was like, all right, well, let me go back. And the beautiful thing about, Mm -hmm. about the literature on BFR is, is that it forces you to be able to connect different domains of exercise science. And so even though I consider myself an expert in exercise science, it's also been in muscle building. It's also been forcing me to kind of gain an appreciation of the cardiovascular hemodynamic, um, the interaction effects between all of these. So it's, Mm -hmm. it's, it's nice to be able to link all of these domains together that you wouldn't normally necessarily consider when you're administering uh, exercise. At least, yeah. at least we would like to think that we are, but let's be honest here. The vast majority of, of exercise prescription does not take into account some of these factors mm-hmm. um, that at least in my personal experience, observing and talking with other clinicians. So it's, it's nice to be able to then integrate a lot of this stuff into the curriculum uh, when I go and I teach uh, the, the application of BFR. Right on. So for those of us that don't play uh, sports ball, Although I played basketball, but I don't follow it. Like, can you remind us, like, who's Dwight Howard? What was his injury? And, um, you know, give us some context around that. And how- so I think, I think I, I actually, I mean, Dwight Howard was an NBA superstar. Yeah. Um, and he was having, a, I can't remember if it was recalcitrant knee pain or he was having something where he was having just problems loading and, and, and in his rehab program. And he, he really like he was using the Delphi, which is the one of the devices that you can use for mm-hmm. blood flow restriction. And he was having some success with being able to get back on the basketball court. And, um, and yeah, I mean, that's basically what, what you can utilize BFR for, for athletes is their rehab, but also in season training to reduce the ground and pound on the joints. Right. So what are some of the other things that uh, you use BFR for, like clinically, whether it's, you know, outpatient or like what, what would be some of the uses, like what are some of the uses that we might not even think about? Like I can, my first thought would be, well, when I was taught how to do ACL rehab, we were using electrodes to stimulate the VMO and doing these weird exercises people couldn't, you know, uh, replicate at home in the clinic to try to get their quads and VMO to fire again. Is it like, is it instead of that kind of thing or, you know, what, what are some of those practical? Yeah, uses no, that's, that that's a great question. I mean, the, the biggest thing that we have to, and the focus of the, the course that I teach is, is really talking about optimizing hypertrophy and strength. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and those are obviously easy to, to visualize with use of blood flow restriction, irrespective of the, the, the science behind why that happens because you're lifting weights, you're going to get stronger, you're going to gain more muscle mass if you get tired. Um, But there's other cool, unique things that can happen when we restrict blood flow. I mean, even going back to uh, how BFR at least was brought to to the States and how Johnny Owens kind of got into it was was that they were the military was using uh, restricting restricting blood flow to, to, to help with limb salvage. And mm. so they knew that the power of hypoxia can drive adaptation. But just like, just like I love chocolate, right? If I eat ch- uh, chocolate, gives me that nice, oh, that rewarding, satisfying feeling of, of oh, deliciousness when I eat chocolate. And 
I'm satisfied for the short term. But then if I keep on eating chocolate, keep on eating chocolate, what happens? I end up getting fat, Mm -hmm. right? So too much of too much of something, just like a lot of pretty much everything that you can think of, like too much of of, of anything is going to be bad. So too much hypoxia is is also really bad, um, which is what we, you know, we see cell cell death and everything. So, um, but hypoxia can be a potent stressor for for adaptation in other tissues so what we're learning is that even getting individuals walking on a treadmill at a very low relative intensity uh, we can improve their aerobic capacity Um, and that's because if we consider what actually makes up our aerobic capacity it's the cardiac output multiplied by the how efficient we are at extracting oxygen that is delivered to the limb Mm -hmm. which is which is what we call arteriovenous difference and so we can either improve our heart's ability to pump out the blood, right? Or we can improve the, the utilization of that blood that's getting pumped out back to the, the, the periphery. And right. we can extract oxygen more efficiently than our mitochondria or be able to, to, to utilize oxygen as part of the Krebs cycle to create oxygen. And thus we're seeing now that, that even getting individuals exercising at very low intensities, that we can improve their aerobic capacity because we're increasing the efficiency of the utilization of oxygen, but also be able to improve their anaerobic mm-hmm. power and other variable. Why? Because now we're, we're forcing the muscle now to work in a very oxygen uh, lacking or hypoxic environment. And thus we're, we're creating a better ability of the, the muscle to buffer some of these ions that might be produced with higher intensity exercise. And so we're able to now, create a situation where again athletes get on and they're like well i'm not really doing much yeah it's 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 strenuous uh from an exertional perspective Mm -hmm. uh, and somewhat painful depending on how you're going to be applying it but you know you're not your heart's not pumping out of your chest like you would with high intensity exercise so we can use very low intensity cardiovascular exercise much like we do with resistance training as a bridge toward higher intensity exercise but potentially create some novel adaptations that we might not necessarily get with high intensity mm-hmm. training, whether that's aerobic or resistance training. Right. Um, further, you know, uh, bones, for example, um, uh, bones are, are, are heal, uh, because we have a, a need for nutrient delivery and that nutrient delivery is, is deliver is, is given to that area via, new formation of new arteries, right? Vascular supply. And so when we have hypoxia, we now stimulate, uh, or we, we, we have this upregulation of what's called HIF-1A, uh, hypoxia inducible factor one alpha. And what that does is basically says, oh crap, there is a lot of, there, I need some oxygen here. I need to get some nutrients. And that signals other mediators like vascular endothelial growth factor, which helps with creation of new arter- arteries and, and new vascular supply from existing uh, arteries, for example, to, to be able to now go and bridge that gap to now start to deliver more oxygen to the, the, the bone. Mm. So we're, we're now seeing, and actually we now have from uh, Dr. Lambert, who's one of the, one of the, uh, uh, an MD who was actually showed uh, in his ACL study that increased bone mineral density in the ACL group that uh, that was that was compared to the same group wow. that was performing all over uh, their body or just all, like lower just limb? well just it it it's it, it's localized yeah um, uh, at least we don't have evidence to suggest right now that it's a systemic effect but you know that those mediators do travel throughout mm-hmm. the body but what we do know is that what we observe in the clinic and, and it all goes back to, to to really honestly muscle right you observe muscle loss in the clinic but that also is it's just a symptom, right? And then what we're learning now is that bone, just like muscle, just like tendon, mm-hmm. just like our, our 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 aerobic capacity. If you don't lose it, if you don't use it, we lose it. Right. And so we're seeing that we're having a distal femoral condyle and proximal tibial condyle, or plateau. We lose, and even the fibular head, we lose bone mineral density. Uh, and so this is one of the first studies that really showed that. Hey, wait like like bone can actually be preserved uh when we use bfr um so that's another tissue that we're like oh wow we can affect that with with low low bfr that's mm-hmm. that's crazy and then the most shocking one which is tendon 
Um, and so when I used to teach uh, last year, year before that too, um, where it would be like, oh, it's great to know when to use BFR, the indications, but it's also really important to understand when maybe we might not necessarily want to consider BFR mm -hmm. uh, for, and tendons were, were one of those, were one of those uh, topics because we have so much evidence and again, tendons, tendinopathies is a very complex topic, but in general, right, the tendinopathies happen because of an overuse, the micro trauma, not, abil not able to adapt to the, to the imposed demands. And so we want to increase the, the physical property of the tendon, right? We want to make stiffer tendons. And the only way that we ha that's been shown to really improve the stiffness of the tendon is by moderate, is chronic, moderate to heavy loading over the period of 12 plus weeks. Mm -hmm. Right, light load when you perform that same exercise does not induce any changes in in the properties of the tendon. Well, Sentner, a German researcher uh, last year, published a paper that compared in the Achilles tendon, uh, twenty to thirty five percent of the one RM standing and sitting calf raises to traditional seventy to eighty five percent calf raises in the same you know type of paradigm, um, and showed equal benefits in creating tendon stiffness, which not only challenges our understanding of how we can approach tendon, potentially increasing the capacity of tendons mm -hmm. in, in rehab and performance, but also our understanding of tendon physiology in general. Because if hypoxia can create this, this uh, change in adaptation, well, you know, and, and we're, we haven't been really able to show this with light load training in general. Well, that opens up a whole plethora of other potential applications for this, uh, for, for wow. use of hypoxia. Yeah. So it's, it's kind of exciting because there, it's really challenging our understanding of, of physiology, but it's also really at least my hope is that it's, it's helping the rehab professionals gain a better appreciation for the science of exercise mm -hmm. because people, I feel like that's a missing link. And yeah. ironically, ironically, does this, I, does this mean like we can, you know, it's with BFR, you're able to get people moving earlier in the rehab process when it otherwise would be too painful to lift at a higher load or higher, you know, uh, perceived effort. So it's funny that you mentioned pain because there is actually a, a very, very significant and growing body of, of literature supporting very strong pain relieving effects of BFR exercise. Um, in fact, uh, Hughes and, and Patterson, who are two of the researchers out in the UK, just published a, a study that was looking at uh, some of the potential mechanisms that underlie the pain relieving effects of BFR and showed that not only is there a very, very, very strong and pressure dependent, meaning the more pressure that you apply to the limb, the stronger the pain relief, mm -hmm. but also there is a slight systemic effect of pain, uh, of, of pain relief, meaning that uh, when you apply BFR to the quads, you can still see some opposite side pain relief. And that allows us to really play around with a little bit of the the way that we structure a rehab session so you mean like kind of like uh graded motor imagery and mirror therapy like i do this my left my left knee is the problem but i could do it on my right knee and it'll help with the left knee. yeah but but typically i would just attack the site in, yeah. in and of itself i mean unless you had a contraindication i mean typically bfr uh is is something that uh yes it's low intensity and yes it's very stressful but um in general they're it's, it's, it's somewhat well tolerated uh, in terms of uh, just being able to apply it like for mm -hmm. knees, for example, as a yeah. home run population. But yeah, I mean, so you talk about the ACL, you mentioned that earlier. Um, and I gave a presentation on this in, in France earlier this year uh, about the strategies for ACL rehab. And, you know, for my, my, my belief is that BFR does never, will not replace what we're currently doing, what's tried and true, but it serves as a complement. Mm -hmm. So it, it complements, it doesn't replace what we're doing. So you mentioned that, uh, you, you know, the problem with, with early on ACL is, is you have this AMI, this arthrogenic muscle inhibition, the inability to fire the quad, and you see that rapid muscle atrophy that happens as a result. 
And so what we can do with the Russian, for example, is you just slap some cuffs on, cuffs on, slap some cuffs on the, on the limb while you're doing the Russian. So not only are you getting the muscle recruitment, right? You're getting now the additional cell swelling and there's the potential for that cell swelling and that additional metabolic stress to be additive, to help with getting some more of that quad back. Not only that, we know that the more discomfort that you potentially, you know, that you're experiencing during your exercise bout, even though it's low loads, Mm -hmm. right? Um, The more pain relief you're going to get. So we have, you know, my own personal you mean rehab. The more discomfort with the cuff versus with the with with, with like the exercise you're doing. Yeah. So yeah. like it wouldn't be like knee. Now, when I say discomfort, I mean exercise induced discomfort. Okay. That's specific to the quadriceps, for example, right. not the knee joint itself. Okay. That would be a little bit different. But um, you can use you can use this pain relieving effect to your advantage. So you can have individuals perform low load BFR exercise, like isometrics, for example, if you're really early stage and, and high pressures, because the higher pressure is going to give you a better response. And then you go gait train. Mm -hmm. So now you have some analgesic effect of from the blood flow restriction exercise, but now you're integrating it into your clinical practice. So it's not just, okay, muscle mass is great, but we also need to consider the global effects of what's going on. So how is their gait? What are they doing? How can we then, you know, make this part of their program, home program, right? Or whatever you're doing in, in, in the clinic. And so it really is important to understand that, that, yeah, like when you're, whenever you're doing strengthening exercises, specifically those that are isolated to target muscle groups, yeah, I think BFR can replace what we're doing mm-hmm. in, in that capacity because you're just doing the same exercise. You're just adding BFR to it, right? So, but I don't think it's going to replace anything like, you know, you're not going to do BFR over something else. If, if like gait training, for example, like I, I still think that it's, it's important to understand and, and implement what's tried and tried and true. And my philosophy of BFR is always under promise and over deliver. Mm -hmm. So we already know that without a shadow of a doubt that we're going to improve our muscle mass and our muscle strength when we integrate blood flow restriction. Um, And now it's just, all right, what are the benefits that are coming out that that's, that are beneficial? Okay, great. That's awesome. But if we know that we're improving our muscle mass, we know that we're improving our metabolic health. We know that when our metabolic health improves our systemic overall balance of inflammation and anti-inflammation are going to be, are going to, are going to change and that's going to help promote better outcomes. Right. That's awesome. So like, I can clearly see like the performance benefits, right? Like, so let me ask you this one question. I can't, so I used to race bicycles, right? I'm sure I used to have my, my, even my wife said yesterday, your legs were, you know, daddy's legs were a lot bigger, (laughs) you know, when I was riding, you know, 400 miles a week or whatever it was Mm -hmm. a lot. I mean, four or 500 miles a week. I spent 25 hours a week on my bike sure I had a ton more mitochondria, right? Because I rode, I commuted to work today, quarter mile. And I'm like, man, my legs are burning. This is the first time I've been on my bike in like a year and a half. Uh-huh. Um, performance wise, it can help me build more, um, more tolerance, uh, more, uh, a, a better um, system to process the uh, blood flow. The, not like, like without the blood flow restriction, but um, process all the energy, oxygen, deliverability, anaerobic threshold, anaerobic capacity, et cetera, right? Mm-hmm. Right, so like to me, I'm like, okay, yes, that's easy. Like, sweet, I wish I had a power meter when I used to race bikes so I could know how much power I did. And then I can see, okay, there's the people that, okay, they're post-surgical, you know, they're gonna atrophy. Um, and, and we can help with that, like you, what you just described. How about like that in-between population um, like the person with back pain or hip pain, it's not, it's a, it's a proximal joint issue or pain syndrome, um, even neck pain. Like I, you're not going to put BFR on my neck. You call that a neck brace, right? <laughs> or not, but, yeah. right? Like how, or something like, you do in private, right? Something you do in private. Um, you know, it's like how, like what's the application there in that middle population, which happens to be majority of people we see in our clinic here, you know? Yeah, what, so good question. Um, you know, there, there is, there is a couple of avenues that I could take this. Um, in general, you know, I, I agree. I think mostly limb problems are, are things that you're going to use BFR for. Mm -hmm. Um, there is something called proximal hypertrophy and that's the concept that you can gain muscle mass and strength 
in areas proximal to the application of the cuff. Mm -hmm. So the, be the best example that I can give, uh, and the easiest one to kind of uh, grasp is, is glute gains from squats. Mm -hmm. Now, how is that, uh, how does that relate? Well, if you look at what the squat exercise is in general, right? You're thinking if you're squatting, the main mover is the quadriceps, right? You're looking for closed chain knee extension, right? So what, what muscles now are involved with closed chain knee extension? Well, you have the quads, obviously, mm -hmm. right? You also have the gastroc soleus because they're going to pull the tibia uh, back uh, in closed chain, which is going to, again, assist in knee extension. And you also have adductor magnus that can act as a hip extensor along with the hamstrings that can also act as hip extensors and they're distal to the cuff. Right. Well, what we do know is that low, low blood flow restriction accelerates fatigue at any given load. All right. So if we're consistently doing uh, squats, then we're going to ultimately at some point reach the fact that our hamstrings, our glutes, or one of the other synergists that are distal to the cuff mm -hmm. are going to start to be able to lose their ability to generate force. And that has to do with the metabolite accumulation inhibiting the muscle fibers ability to contract. All right. Now the glutes then come on in, a, in an added way. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so in deconditioned clients and people that have proximal that, that have issues in their hip, you can definitely gain some benefit with using blood flow restriction, not to mention that what I just said before, which is that pain relieving effect okay. of using a very taxing exercise on the systemic benefits. Right. But I always say BFR is a bridge to heavier lifting. So I would never if my, if my glute hypertrophy is the goal, right? I'm not going to go and slap on cuffs and have them do, have them do squat exercise if in lieu of doing something like a heavy hip thrust mm -hmm. or in doing like a heavy single leg squat or a heavy uh, single leg bridge. Because really the benefit for your time is, is not there for, for me. Now, if your rationale is pain relief and it's the – the okay we're going to do this for that and bfr kind of fits into that plan sure um and the same principle applies in the upper extremity and we have research to show that there is some uh, proximal hypertrophy that you can get and that's been observed in in many studies and even there's a systematic review on it um and it was just another paper published actually like last week uh, with upper extremity exercise. So we see it a lot in lower extremity, uh, but upper extremity exercise sees that as well. And that's likely a byproduct of the increased sympathetic activation that we get with, um, with the strenuous exercise. But again, that kind of segues into, well, what populations might be eh, for it because sympathetic activation tends to be a condition that exists with a lot of comorbidities like diabetes, hypertension, obesity. So as we're going into, and that's, that's, that's a very important subtopic in, in BFR, uh, is that yes, generally speaking, BFR is well tolerated even in those individuals, but we need to take strategies as this, as this methodology, this approach is, is now going more widespread that we need to mitigate the risk of, of this from, from happening because blood flow restriction uh, goes by a terrible name, BFR, terrible name, blood flow restriction. When I go and speak with physicians, they're like, why the hell would I want to restrict blood flow to a limb? Muscles need blood flow, right? right? But, but we're never fully restricting blood flow. We're, we're, only, we're only restricting a degree of blood flow to facilitate a relatively hypoxic environment to then promote those adaptations on a, on a long-term scale. So it's, it, it really is like, and that's, that, this is where like the course that I'm writing and the course that I teach it, in person, it's, it's not enough to understand blood flow restriction and the benefits, mm -hmm. right? Because anybody can hand someone a paper and say, you read this, like whatever. And honestly, physicians don't read that crap. Let's be honest here. They, 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 they just want to know that evidence exists and it, you're not, you're not pulling something out of your ass. Right. Because I've spoken with many, many physicians and they don't read any of the papers. Like, come on, let's be honest here. Right. Um, but what they do want to know 
is they want to know how this can affect certain different uh, certain conditions and why for example we would we would hold off on bfr on one type of patient but might want to do it on another population and so it's important to really have a good grasp of the fundamentals of exercise science mm-hmm. and then how our body is like a machine i mean i i am the human performance mechanic my my thing is i view the body as like a very complex machine that when you know when something goes out of whack it takes a skilled mechanic to be able to look at the problem diagnose it and then provide the remedy right but you need to know what the problems potentially could be yeah. and what the solutions could potentially be before you then go and say oh i want to do bfr mm-hmm. um and so that's why we spend a significant amount of time talking about safety and and exercise response in general and what the expected exercise response should be so you know what the you know when you deviate from that yeah are there so like nick are there like uh populations like neuropediatric populations that benefit or re reasons to get outside of orthopedics with this? Yeah. I mean, so the research on non orthopedic conditions is pretty scarce. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, there, there is the potential, um, for, uh, what, what they use a form of blood flow restriction application. It's called a remote ischemic conditioning or um, ischemic preconditioning. What that is, is you basically inflate it uh, for over 100% of your, what we call your limb occlusion pressure, meaning that there's theoretically, theoretically, there is no blood getting in and there's no blood getting out. Um, And then you do that for repeated inflation and deflation. They've done this actually before surgeries, like transplants. And they've actually shown that uh, in, uh, you can reduce post uh, post um, surgical mor- uh, opiate intake mm-hmm. and perceptions of pain from having this this potential uh, this potential intervention, um, and they've also done this on um, or there's the there's the thought that if you uh, highly fatigue out a spastic muscle, for example, and you have spasticity, uh, that there may be the potential for BFR to help with that because it accelerates the fatiguing process, right? right. But um, there really isn't a lot of research that, that's using ischemic training on, on neurological populations. And mm-hmm. in pediatrics, you know, there is no age limit for the application of BFR. Um, we know that it really doesn't have any sort of negligible uh, adverse uh, effects on the uh the growth plates or at least that's what the science would would tell us um and in fact there's research now that's that's looking at very young kids that are undergoing acl reconstruction i think it's the chop uh one of the hospitals connecticut children's i think is is undergoing an acl trial with very young kids Um, but in general the tolerance or the attention span and -hmm. the tolerance of the exercise is going to limit pediatric application because these kids um, you know, it's, it's not a fun, ex- it's not, it's not fun to be able yeah. to, to go through BFR exercise. It's effective. Absolutely. Um, but again, everything is a cost, right? If it's free, right. everyone, you know, it, it's, 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 it, I always like to, I always really like to go back to analogies that, that people can, can grasp and understand because th- that can contextualize anything that we, you know, we're doing. Right. So BFR, if it was easy, everyone would do it. And how bad do you really want it? And that's mm-hmm. kind of how I frame, frame BFR. It will work for you. Trust me. The science is very sound. It's rooted right. in, 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 in a lot of science. It's just that it's going to be uncomfortable. Yeah. So one of the first times I saw it, and I didn't know it was what it was, was like some program on, it was, it was called like the gun show or Armageddon or something like that. It was like <laughs> someone's like trainers basically teaching people how to get, you know, ripped and jacked. Mm-hmm. right but what it was what i what it was were like elastic bands that they just you just like yank tight on your arms to do your you know bicep curls and stuff mm-hmm. like that is that the same thing is that safe or you know where i mean i mean let's be honest here if i i mean if in general in general you know bfr has been shown to be safe uh and effective with a variety of different applications and um, again, I take it upon myself to try to promote optimal evidence-based practice. Um, so we do, do, we do discuss that kind of training, which is mm-hmm. elastic band. You wrap it around. Um, the problem I have with that is the lack of objectivity and reliability. 
um, what you want to do is you want to just maintain a minimum threshold of pressure right? That's typically about 40 to 50% of the pressure it takes to completely occlude arterial flow in the arms and about 50 to 60% of the pressure that it takes to occlude uh, arterial flow in the legs, right? Higher pressures don't necessarily augment the results, at least from a musculoskeletal perspective, but may have other secondary effects on the vascular system that might be upregulated following uh, hypoxia, right? Mm -hmm. So like H1F and uh, HIF1A and on some of those other variables that might depend on higher pressure. But for generally speaking, uh, you don't need that high of a pressure. The problem though, is when you start to use a subjective scale, like a pressure scale, like that seven out of 10 tightness, uh, it works of course, but then you're creating a situation where you might be exercising under full occlusion or you might be exercising with not enough pressure and then you're better off just exercising, you're better off doing something else mm -hmm. uh, instead. And so for me, I just want to make sure that safe practices is, is adhered to and is promoted. And so it's it, now the technology is out there where not only is there previously there was a, you needed to use a Doppler, right? You need to buy a Doppler and you needed to be trained in the technique. And now, I mean, even two weeks ago, there was a paper that was, that, that was the second paper on the topic that, that supported the use of a pulse ox mm -hmm. for, for upper extremity BFR. Oh, wow. So, so pulse ox is very easily, is very easily uh, used. You basically just pump it up until the pulse ox disappears. You pump it up about 10, 10 more millimeters over, and then you slowly lower it. Once that pulse ox starts to register, that's that person's limb occlusion pressure. And it's very easy, and I've been experimenting it with ever since that first paper got published uh, back last year. And so it's good to see accumulating evidence, uh, a more more feasible uh, yeah. practices. So it, it you know it does work, sure. But the problem too is once you start to exercise with full under full occlusion, you're now increasing the 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 adverse responses to higher pressures. Yeah. Um, so that's, what are the adverse responses, and what like? What is unsafe? Because you keep saying you want to help people do it safely. So what are the adverse effects? Yeah. And, you know, so what's unsafe? So every time we exercise, right, we, we activate something that's called the exercise presser reflex. And the exercise presser reflex is a fantastic conglomeration of the complexity of the human body. Mm -hmm. We have these sensors that are called afferents that rely, uh, that, that, that lie in, around in and around the muscle fibers themselves and what they do is they sense chemical and mechanical changes in the local muscle environment these connections then go all the way up to the brain the cardiovascular control centers of the brain which then upon activation will increase heart rate blood pressure and ventilation rate right and so when we exercise we need to deliver blood flow to the exercising muscle and the exercise pressure reflex, the afferents, they signal that, oh, we need more energy. We need to get more blood flow to the area. And so they signal that then increases the, the heart rate, blood pressure. And again, things that are associated with sympathetic nervous system, mm -hmm. right? So we, we have an upregulation of the sympathetic nervous system, a depression of the parasympathetic nervous system. And so we have this increase in, in intra-exercise blood pressure. That's normal. Right, and that's intensity dependent, and that changes between type of contraction, exercise modality, um, et cetera, et cetera. But in general, the higher and the more intense the exercise, the more demanding the exercise is, the higher the sympathetic response, the higher the exercise pressure reflex is, is activated. And so when we have individuals that have comorbidities like hypertension, obesity, diabetes, these are things that are now are coming very common in our vernacular. We're dealing with a mm -hmm. lot of patients that have these conditions. We need to be aware that the, there is altered muscle metabol reflex, meaning Meaning that the afferents, that the the particular afferents that are responsible for sensing the changes in the uh, in the metabolite accumulation, are they're like they're hyper ready, and so they're going to then signal and create an exaggerated response to this exercise, which is going to further increase the exercise induced hypertensive responses to exercise. Now, there's a complicating factor, right? Because the the afferents what they also do is they they signal to to the sympathetic nervous system to release all these these norepinephrine adrenaline all that other stuff now our blood vessels should be able to dilate 
when this process occurs, right? That allows for the, so the, the extra pressure reflex signals to the body, hey, I need more oxygen, right? Well, now the local response is a vasodilation. And we call this process functional sympatholysis. And functional sympatholysis allows us to be able to continue to exercise at a higher intensity because it allows our muscles to, to be supplied with oxygen and blood flow. Well, in hypertensive individuals, for example, this, because of arterial stiffening, this process now is impaired. So now you create this, this, this process whereby the afferents need more oxygen, the signal to the, to the body, we need more oxygen. oxygen uh, blood flow continues to get delivered, increasing blood pressure, heart rate, et cetera. But then the, the artery doesn't, is not able to vasodilate effectively. So now it, it's, it creates this feed forward, this vicious feed forward cycle that can really have the potential to spike intra-exercise blood pressure uh, to unsafe levels. Mm. So if we carelessly apply blood flow restriction, which we are literally facilitating an increase in sympathetic tone with the application of, the, of, of BFR, uh, especially when we use higher pressures, right? Because th that, that, uh, that increases exercise-induced discomfort, but also hypoxia and all these other drivers that can potentially further the feed-forward mechanism, we can create a potentially dangerous environment. Uh, so even though we're trying to help our clients, mm -hmm. we can end up actually creating an adverse event. And so there are strategies that we can use to mitigate this exercise induced increase in hypertension uh, with the application of BFR, uh, but also with our exercise selections and other things to help reduce the chance of an adverse event occurring uh, within our own practice. Got it. That's important. Well, thanks for um, going in depth on that. Yeah. Um, it like real quick, we got a few more minutes. Um, I get uh, maybe one or two more questions, but um, if someone's out there like, Oh, you know, how do I know if BFR would help me in my practice? What would be one or two kind of questions or patient populations or problems that they could say, oh yeah, I should take a look into this, you know, because there's a lot of different types of physical therapy, a lot of different types of people that listen to the show. I mean, so I, I will tell you that, uh, that knee osteoarthritis is a home run population mm -hmm. uh, because those individuals tend to have a lot of exercise induced knee pain and the current recommendations for strengthening involve moderate to heavy loading, uh, which again has been shown in the long run to be effective. But the problem is they're in pain doing it. They're right. in pain the next day and then it turns them off to exercise. Blood flow restriction can provide an avenue to keep them excited about exercise and really feel that that burn. Uh, that's why we say mm -hmm. chase the pump. Hashtag chase the pump because you're really, you're really feeling that burn, and you know that great beneficial muscular adaptations are happening when you're when you're having them do that, and they don't have any knee pain, which is even better. And then the second really is if you're challenging your patients at all, right? Like all all you need to do really is if you're using the the traditional, and I hate to group PTs, but this is basically what a lot of people do: three sets of ten, three sets of fifteen, whatever and you're doing any sort of upper or lower body exercise and you're and you really just you're just doing it for whatever well just mm -hmm. slap some cuffs on because you're going to yeah. augment the fatigue response and get them more bang for their buck in a non specific way even if you're not really un, if you're not really like oh uh, condition wise or whatever the likelihood is that 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 muscle mass that pain relief that strength response improving function is all going to help improve their quality of life, make them happier, get them back to the activities that they love quicker than whatever the hell you're probably doing. Yeah. Uh, and so it fits in with my training, my, my model as well. I mean, I do rehab to performance. I know that's cheesy, but I have people that are in rehab and they, they want to stay in under my umbrella. And so blood flow restriction can help provide that bridge to get them from rehab to performance. But also occasionally when they're, when they are training, you know, I have clients that just want to do BFR. They love yeah. the feeling. People get addicted. It's crazy. Wow. wow. Right on. So if someone wants to learn more about BFR and, and get in touch with you, what's the best place for them to go? Where do they, where should they find you on online, Instagram website? Yeah. I mean, my, my Instagram account, uh, at, the HPM, so it's just short for the human performance mechanic, um, is literally, I would say, the most comprehensive open access BFR research uh, platform on the planet, on the internet. Um, I do my best to provide an unbiased source of education. So I don't, I don't have any dogs in the fight. I don't sell any mm -hmm. cuffs. I don't do anything. It's purely about, about fulfilling my mission of helping get people back to the activities that they love as quickly as possible using the most up-to-date 
uh, you know, evidence-based modalities that are supported by the research. So blood flow restriction is that. Um, and so, yeah, so the HPM and then also the BFRpros.com uh, is, is the, the company website where I do education. And hopefully in the next couple months, you'll be able to take the online course, which is probably going to be unlike anything that you've, you've ever thought about taking because it's a very large comprehensive course uh, that you're not going to be able to take in, in one sitting. Um, yeah, so, you've been working on that for weeks, uh, months, right? months, months, <laughs> like months, just recording. I mean, just, yeah, recording yeah. Months, it's, right? it's, 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 it's been a labor of love, but I think it's, it's going to be something that's sorely needed uh, because really it's, it, it truly is just about making, you know, getting people excited about BFR evidence-based practice and really breaking down very complex uh, topics in exercise science, because once we understand the body's normal response, then we can then talk about the abnormal responses and then how BFR can fit into that, that equation to help promote better outcomes. Right. I mean, that's really what it's all about. That's awesome. That's awesome, Nick. Well, Nick, uh, thank you very much for coming on the show. Appreciate oh. it. I'm very happy to be here. So thank you. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, it's been exciting to see where you come and I'm excited to see where you go with this course and with BFR and, and everything that you guys are doing. So, um, so check out Nick at the HPM on Instagram and BFR pros, not bros. Not bros. <laughs> and we'll put all that. We'll put all the links in the show notes. Um, all right, man. I appreciate you. Uh, everyone, if you're listening, this is the cash PD lunch hour, chase the pump and, uh, get out there and check out the BFR stuff. Cause it's the new wave. Right. That's uh, it. Mine, mine aren't that big. <laughs> <laughs> I'm tall and lanky, but I can oh, ride a bike yeah. all day long. Man, so. I can't. <laughs> all right. Thank you guys very much. Thanks, Nick. Appreciate it.